Good afternoon and welcome everybody and I'm delighted to see some familiar faces out there. Um, you know, we know that uh, in the spirit of the Humanities Festival, we really want to hear from you. We know you have interesting questions, that this is a topic that many of you have been involved with and uh, are interested in and have worked in. So our method of going forward is going to be that our two speakers, first Larry Yakel and then Professor um, Joseph Margulies, We'll speak each for 15 minutes. They'll come to the podium, and then we will open it up to questions. And of course, they will be able to speak at greater length during the question period as well. Um, my introductory remarks are very brief. I just want to welcome you and just make a few comments. Of course, the principle behind habeas corpus can be traced to the Roman Empire and then to the Magna Carta and is rooted in the idea that a monarch or person in power cannot imprison or confine anyone without legal justification. The job of the law is to establish authority, to establish the legitimacy of authority, which means authority cannot be abused or perceived as abused. This has been expressed as habeas corpus in the law since long before 1200 and reaffirmed in the time of Charles II, Henry II, Henry VI, and then to counter the work of the Star Chamber and up to the present. For the British, it is part of their unwritten constitution. For the Americans, it is part of the written constitutions. The action may be brought by anyone, and it asks that the individual be produced and publicly exhibited. The idea is that the arbitrary acts of the monarch or king or executive in unjustly imprisoning any person offends all of us in the polity and that thus anyone can ask for relief. The remedy is equitable. There is a byway which has been a particular concern to me in my research on 1890 Chicago and that is the use of habeas corpus as a means for a parent typically a father, to regain the custody of children taken from him, children in orphanages or social services, or taken away by, by the mother, as was the situation with my subject, Florence Kelly. Today we're going to hear about habeas corpus and from two very distinguished lawyers who have both been interpreting it and leading uh, the development of that law here in the United States. So please join me in welcoming again our two speakers. Uh, hi, thanks for having me. We're meant to discuss big ideas. Um, I want to discuss two ideas, two old ideas. Um, they're uh, often brigaded together as though they were one. They're really two. The first is the substantive principle that no human being should be deprived of liberty without just cause. Now that's a ringing proposition. It's uh, so profound, uh, so familiar, that we might take it for granted. We shouldn't. This proposition has been more violated than accepted and, and demonstrated in uh, human history. It's a fragile idea, but it is profound. It's a big idea and a very important one. Habeas corpus is related to the substantive proposition of individual liberty in that it provides the, the mechanism of enforcement. Habeas corpus makes that substantive proposition of individual liberty real in the world. This is a lawyer's idea. Uh, uh, lawyers are, are, are pleased with uh, abstract ideas, to be sure, but at some point, a lawyer wants to know how it is that some substantive proposition can be made reality, how it can be brought down to earth and made effective uh, in the real world in which we live. And habeas corpus provides that mechanism the, uh, the arrangement for habeas corpus is uh, simple. It's elegant in its simplicity. The prisoner who uh, alleges that his detention is unlawful files a petition with the court. 
the court then issues the writ. This is the classic uh, model. We, we've changed it a bit uh, historically, but this is the classic model. The, uh, the court issues the writ of habeas corpus, the function of which is to require the custodian, that person who holds the prisoner in detention, to produce the body of the prisoner in court and to file a return that explains the basis of the detention. And then you see how it works. The, the custodian complies with the writ, uh, produces the body uh, of the prisoner and the return. The court then is in a position to evaluate the return and to decide whether the custodian's explanation for the detention is just, and if so, then the prisoner is remanded to custody. If not, the prisoner is released. It's an effective, long-standing, beautiful, symmetrical idea, habeas corpus, as the, the mechanism for enforcing the principle of individual liberty. We have celebrated this in our culture, in our literature, in our politics uh, for as long as anyone can remember. Dr. Johnson said that habeas corpus is the principal advantage that English law, English institutions have against the governments of other countries. The great uh, civil libertarian at Harvard, Zachary Chafee, said that habeas corpus is the most important right in the Constitution. Uh, freedom of worship, I'm paraphrasing, and and freedom of speech will survive, but only habeas corpus can penetrate a prison wall. Uh, the history uh, is uh, a splendid uh, story in itself. There's a, a stirring uh, narrative here uh, that stretches uh, certainly behind uh, Magna Carta, but uh, in the, the ordinary uh, uh, context, uh, English context, uh, it stretches back to Magna Carta. You can look it up, I did. This romantic history I'm about to give you is, is right there in Wikipedia. Uh, <laughs> on the plains of Runnymede, the barons uh, struck their deal with King John and crafted Magna Carta, the great charter of English liberty that, that ended uh, the despotic uh, power of the crown and established uh, human liberty and brigaded with that at the time was habeas corpus as the effective mechanism of enforcement. The 39th chapter of uh, uh, Magna Carta is celebrated. No free man shall be taken or imprisoned save by the lawful judgment of his peers or by the law of the land. The principle of individual liberty are connected to, linked to, vitally with habeas corpus. And then the idea, so the narrative goes, is that in this country, our federal constitution succeeded to Magna Carta, and habeas corpus here, as in England, provided the mechanism of enforcement. In our constitution, we do have the suspension clause, the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus shall not be suspended unless in case of rebellion or invasion, the public safety shall require it. The only human individual right set out in the body of the original constitution. And then great statutes in this country, the 1789 Act and the 1867 Habeas Corpus Act established federal court jurisdiction to entertain petitions from prisoners in either federal or state custody to inquire into the validity of their detention. That is a wonderful and glorious and stirring history. And none of it much is true. <laughs> history is elusive stuff. We need to be clear-eyed about this, and we shouldn't be carried away with the romance, uh, even uh, in, in this uh, romantic context of individual liberty and uh, habeas corpus. You know, Magna Carta wasn't the great charter of English liberty at all. It was a laundry list of deals worked by noblemen, noblemen with King John. Uh, the law of the land referred to in the 1215 document was probably just customary law for the protection of wealthy landowners. A free man wasn't an ordinary person. A free man was a wealthy landowner, a, a nobleman. 
And uh, if a nobleman was to be judged by uh, anyone, it was to be by his own, his peers, not by his social inferiors. Habeas corpus wasn't mentioned in uh, Magna Carta. There was a writ of habeas corpus at the time, but it was a modest administrative uh, instrument that courts used. It was more or less a summons. It was a way to produce a person in court in order that some adjudication could go forward. Um, uh, early on, there's even a case to be made that habeas corpus was allied with the law of arrest. It wasn't so much that habeas corpus was used to, to uh, free someone from custody, but rather to put someone in custody, to, to bring them into court uh, coercively in order to adjudicate a dispute. Uh, there is another uh, theory that as habeas corpus developed, uh, habeas corpus was issued uh, not to, to ensure that, that the king didn't hold someone in unjust uh, custody, but rather on behalf of the king to ensure that somebody else didn't hold the king's subjects in custody so that they wouldn't be available to protect the king or to, play, to pay him uh, tribute or to serve in his wars. It took 500 years before the ideas we associate with habeas corpus came to be attached to habeas corpus retrospectively. Now, I have to tell you that I think this is the romantic stirring history. It's not that habeas corpus was originally such a wonderful and splendid idea. It's that we made it something of that sort deliberately over time. Uh, it was in fits and starts, not in any linear way. Uh, and again, it, it's hard to say exactly how uh, this occurred. Sir Edward Cook certainly had a lot to do with it, John Selden. They crafted very deliberately protections for individuals in England against royal power. And then this is the way of lawyers to soften the blow, to, to make their argument uh, more persuasive. They tended then to attach very creative ideas to something old, Magna Carta. And in this country, no one knew really what the suspension clause was all about uh, until last summer. It was only last summer in the Boumediene case that the Supreme Court, for the first time in over 200 years, began to explain what the suspension clause means. And that only because, after all this time, finally, Congress and the President pressed the point. And previous to this, no one had. Habeas corpus uh, is, is used uh, and has been used in this country in, in modern times in two principal ways. Um, one of them, and uh, uh, this is what's primarily in the news these days, is a check on executive detention. And the Guantanamo cases are good illustrations of this. There, the prisoners are held not because they've been convicted of crimes, uh, not because they've even been charged with crimes, but rather because they're thought to be enemy combatants. They are held in executive custody to incapacitate them. Habeas corpus is an available vehicle for that. And uh, we've seen that, that it does uh, work in, in that context. Uh, habeas corpus is much more common in the criminal justice context. Uh, even though uh, uh, a defendant uh, is convicted uh, in, in a trial and uh, the conviction and sentence, sometimes a death penalty sentence, are approved on uh, review. Nonetheless, habeas corpus is available to look into the facts of the matter and to determine really whether the detention serving a sentence or awaiting conviction or awaiting execution uh, is just. This is a jurisdiction that existed, has existed a long time in this country. It has never been uh, uh, all that uh, aggressive, I must say. In the middle part of the 20th century, there was a time when uh, federal courts did fairly routinely use habeas corpus to investigate whether the Bill of Rights was complied with in state criminal trials. 
and uh, whether uh, appellate courts uh, did appropriately correct any uh, errors of federal law made in trials. Um, but since then, uh, in, in a host of ways, a habeas corpus has been trimmed back. You know, there, there is a third idea I, I'd like to uh, mention to you before I stop. It's a new idea, not an old one, and it's not a big idea at all. In my view, it's a dangerous, troubling idea. It's this, that in the modern age, we have uh, grown beyond habeas corpus. We don't need it anymore. It's a relic of the past. We have better institutions now, better courts, operating in a more uh, regular and fair way. And if they make uh, mistakes, for example, in criminal trials, we have appellate courts to correct those errors. And we don't need this ancient, archaic thing, habeas corpus, uh, around anymore. The functions that it once served can be uh, handled in other ways. This, I think, is very dangerous. However romantic and, and unrealistic, historically, uh, our uh, associations uh, with habeas corpus. This is a splendid vehicle for protecting individual liberty. And even if it's not been around so long as one might think, it has been around a long time. It has stood the test of time. It does operate in its elegant, simple way. In 1915, the Supreme Court heard Leo Frank's case, a murder case from Atlanta, Georgia. Leo Frank was charged with, with uh, murder, was convicted uh, in state court, and the Georgia Supreme Court sustained the conviction. It appeared on the record that uh, the usual regular forms were observed uh, in a sterile kind of way. It, it looked like a fair and appropriate proceeding such that his penalty uh, of death uh, was appropriate. And the Supreme Court was asked then whether habeas corpus uh, might nonetheless uh, be appropriate as well, whether a federal court should uh, use the habeas corpus nonetheless to inquire into the circumstances under which Leo Frank had been convicted. And the court declined. This was 1915. Justice Holmes dissented. Holmes pointed out, and the court had to recognize, that this wasn't any kind of trial at all. It had been dominated by an anti-Semitic mob. There is no question at all that it was unfair top to bottom and that the Georgia Supreme Court had presided over a, sh a sham. Holmes said this. You don't understand habeas corpus, he meant. He said this. Habeas corpus cuts through all forms and goes to the very tissue of the structure. It comes in from the outside, not in subordination to the proceedings. And although every form may have been preserved, opens the inquiry whether they have been more than an empty shell. Habeas corpus has this special, ancient, uh, archaic function. Uh, in support of the principle of individual liberty. A few years later, in the Moore case from Arkansas, factually similar case, Justice Holmes was able to, to achieve a majority and wrote that set about, about habeas corpus into American law. I must tell you that, that, that since then, uh, we have tended to, uh, to, to move away from, from Holmes' position and habeas corpus no longer has the kind of muscular significance in criminal cases that it once uh, had. Though again, this move, this move, this, the sense that, that habeas corpus is no longer needed and that our processes can get along without it is that third troubling, dangerous idea I suggested a moment ago. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. I'm Joe Margulies. I'm um, astounded uh, to see all of you. Uh, when they contacted me a while ago uh, from the Chicago Humanities Festival and said, would you like to come and speak about uh, habeas, I thought 
I, yeah, I, we'll meet in a Starbucks, right? I was, <laughs> So, I, 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 you know, I, if we get tired, I will adjourn to my living room. Um, and, and, and that's related to something I want to chat with you about, and I want to come to habeas and come to my discussion of habeas in a roundabout way. Um, as, as Larry pointed out, the principal uh, mechanism by which we discuss habeas now, the prism through which we discuss it, is uh, its application at Guantanamo. And it makes me wonder. And, I, and, I've, and I've, I've wondered this for some time now, what it is about Guantanamo that, that generates this much interest. Just yesterday, uh, uh, Senator Obama uh, made other, another statement about uh, what he would do at, with, Obama, with uh, Guantanamo if he were elected, and how and when he would close it, and, and so on. No question in his mind that he'll close it. Um, and, 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 you know, I don't ask this rhetorically. Uh, it's fair to ask what it is we are reacting to when we have this strong reaction to Guantanamo and what it has come to represent. It can't be the size. It's only about 200, I'm not minimizing this, I've devoted the last seven years of my career to this, but it's only 255 prisoners. It is smaller than death row in Texas. Um, <laughs> it, where, I, where, I, where I also used to practice, where I first became uh, familiar with Larry's work, it can't be the conditions. The conditions there are reprehensible in many respects, uh, but they are patterned after maximum security uh, facilities in the United States. There are thousands of prisoners in the United States that are under similar uh, or worse conditions. It can't be the fact that they're held without trial because we have literally thousands of prisoners held in uh, for uh, immigration detention who are also held without trial all over the country. Some of them are held, in, in fact, most of them are held in jails that aren't even made for long-term detention, but they can be held for an extended periods of time, not even in prisons, but just in, in, in pretrial confinement. So, so what is it? And, and, and I think about that a lot, um, and it leads me, especially now, especially now, four days before the election, and, and given what, what has uh, transpired in our in, in, in the controversy uh, leading up to the election to come to habeas this way. I think it is particularly important at this moment to ask these questions because once again in American history, well-meaning well -meaning patriots uh, pause from their labors to remind us what it takes to be a true American and remind us uh, what it means to conduct oneself uh, as only an American would do. And as this community, as this audience surely knows, that there are few patterns of thought uh, more firmly fixed in American history than the periodic attack on the foreign menace, the alien other that whose very existence, whose presence threatens our uh, American system, threatens our laws and our democratic institutions. That is probably one of the most common refrains in American history uh, that you can find. And throughout our history, there are those who seem to know, uh, frankly, they seem to know this with deadly certainty, who it is, uh, who is and who is not a true American and what conduct bestows upon them that title. The late junior senator from Wisconsin, he surely knew. Um, before him, Father Charles Coughlin, the famous radio priest of the 30s who thundered against the Jews, he knew. The hundred percenters, uh, the hundred percenters were the people and organizations who sprung up like weeds uh, during and after the First World War. They were a, a collection, a substantial collection, of self-appointed guardians whose mission it was to guarantee 100% Americanism in all civic and political and cultural and commercial institutions. Uh, but in my readings, you have to go back to, or even earlier, not quite as far as what, where Larry took us, but uh, to the mid-19th century for some of the most apt comparisons to what we hear today and what we heard then. Because in the 20th century, the dominant threat was radicalism. But in the 19th century, the, the menace the other was not radicalism, it was Rome. And there were 
literally thousands, an uncountable number of books and pamphlets and newspapers and tracts and speeches, this was mercifully before blogging, uh, <laughs> that, that warned good Americans, good Americans of, quote, this anti-Christian system with its soul-corrupting and soul-destroying influence. And one particularly prolific editor of an anti-Catholic paper explained his patriotic impulse this way. With the deliberate conviction that popery ought always to be loathed and execrated, not only by all Christians, but also by every patriot, we shall endeavor to unfold its detestable impieties, corruptions, and mischiefs. We shall condemn the monstrous progeny of Babylon the Great without measure. This history that I talk about, a history that I can really just barely touch on, but that I, I suspect many of you are, have some familiarity with, captures one conversation in American culture. And sometimes that conversation is the dominant one. And there is no point in saying, as some people sometimes do, that it is un-American. Uh, there is no point in saying that. It is a fact of American history. It is a pattern of American thought. The particulars change, of course, and I would like to think that a Father Coughlin could not achieve a radio audience of three million people today as he did uh, during the New Deal. Uh, but the cultural continuity, the cultural continuity, the link between past and present is, I would suggest to you, if you take a close look at it, undeniable. But I would urge you to think that it is hardly the only pattern, relevant pattern of thought. There is another conversation that takes place when the voices of tolerance, the voices of dissent and individualism predominate, and it is every bit as possible to trace that conversation through history, through American history, as it is to trace its absence. And the fascinating point of study, at least from me, for me, is when society shifts from one conversation to another, when society shifts from where the dominant conversation is one of intolerance and a forced, contrived, artificial conformity to one where there is a tolerance and, in fact, a, even a celebration of diversity. When that shift takes place, and that's where habeas comes in. You probably were wondering if I was going to come back <laughs> to habeas. My study of these periods, and I spend an inordinate amount of, well, it's not inordinate for me, but I spend a great deal of time. In fact, my wife tells me I spend more time with the House Un-American Activities Committee than I do with her. <laughs> um, my study of these periods, these, these, what I call these competing patterns of thought, lead me to conclude that broad, there will always be fringes, but that broad sweeps of American society will not long sustain an animosity toward this other, whatever the other of the day is, unless they believe that the other is fundamentally, fundamentally different than they are. And that requires that in all respects, the communist, the Catholic, the German, or the Jew, is not just different in degree, but in kind from the good American. They have to believe that these other are the anti-Americans. And the perception that this creates, that we cling to and apply a set of values that the other does not, is what allows us to ignore and to look past what is otherwise an anomalous intolerance in American culture. And mind you, my sense, my reading of it, is not that during these periods we are unaware that we are being intolerant. We know it. We perceive it. It is pointed out to us. It is understood. But the perception is that the threat to America and her institutions is sufficiently great as to excuse the intolerance in order to preserve the nation and its sacred millennial character. But when we abandon these values and when we cross to what the vice president called the dark side, as he said, describing the beginning of the war on terror, <clears throat> that is when intolerance 
conformity, forced conformity, gradually becomes more than we can abide and the dominant social conversation will gradually shift. That's what it seems to me. I didn't see it at the time. I am the first to say I didn't see this at the time when we began the litigation in Rasul, which was the first case that went to the Supreme Court uh, on the rights of prisoners, the habeas case on the rights of prisoners at Guantanamo. But habeas, and more broadly, what habeas has come to represent to, I suspect, a substantial fraction of you, the mistreatment of prisoners, is this kind of conversation shifter. The failure to comply with the Geneva Conventions, the artful, legalistic dodging of prohibitions against torture, the perception that we have resorted to sustained patterns of lawlessness and cruelty, and most importantly, the deliberate adoption of coercive interrogation techniques that were very consciously patterned after those used against U.S. soldiers by the North Koreans and the Chinese communists. The combination of those things, which is what people conceive of when they talk about habeas and when they talk about Guantanamo, has threatened, it seems to me, to degrade, to break down the vital psychological barrier that has to exist between us and them to excuse the intolerance. And when that barrier falls, it seems to me the lesson of history is that more and more people begin to look about themselves and ask, what have we done? And it is at that moment that the voices of tolerance, which were always there but were muted, reclaim their appeal. And occasionally, but only very occasionally, the law can articulate these values and in that way contribute to these changing conversations. And in our history, it is habeas, as Larry pointed out, in our history, it is habeas that has often provided this opportunity. And he quoted from one of the most important Supreme Court decisions and one of the most important Supreme Court language uh, that Justice Holmes ever gave us. But there is another that I want to share with you from roughly the same period. In 1919, George Borkin, who was a famous and now unknown uh, but very courageous federal district judge in Montana, stood in the center of an angry storm swirling about him and granted the writ of habeas corpus to an alleged radical who was held for deportation. <clears throat> His name was John Jackson. And Judge Borkin had this to say about the delirium that was sweeping the country. Assuming petitioner is of the so-called reds and of the evil practice charged against him, he and his kind are less a danger to America than are those who endorse or use the methods that brought him to deportation. These latter are the mob and the spirit of violence and, in and intolerance incarnate, the most alarming manifestation in America today. They incline the people toward arbitrary power, which for protection cowards too often seek and knaves too readily grant. They and the government by hysteria that they stimulate are more to be feared than all the miserable, baited, bedeviled reds that are their ostensible target. And so, and I wanna open this up to conversation, but when we ask what is the big thing about habeas and what is the next big thing, sometimes, the answer points us to something that is novel, something that is new. But in this case, here, the answer is entirely familiar. We have had these competing conversations before. We will surely have these competing conversations again. And at least in this setting, in what the Supreme Court euphemistically calls troublous times, it is this conversation, it is this debate, not the answer, that makes us truly American. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much to both of our speakers. Um, can the people with the microphones please set them up and get ready to pass them to the audience? But I'll start off by asking uh, Professor uh, Yakel. You know, it was Abraham Lincoln who first suspended the writ. Do you want to say something about that? So, you know, the good guys and bad guys, you know, sometimes it's not so clear. 
the look of this room. Is this on? Uh, yeah, but you have to talk louder. From the look of this room, I dare say there are better historians of the Civil War here than I am. <laughs> you are. Uh oh. <laughs> you. Are, I, sh I should stop. That's not what I meant. <laughs> <laughs> you mean we all live through it, right? We all live through it, right? <laughs> I am now going to tell you all I know about <laughs> Lincoln, in his wisdom, uh, did, as an executive matter, uh, authorize his generals to suspend the writ of habeas corpus. Um, and uh, uh, Chief Justice Tawney, in a celebrated uh, uh, opinion in the Merriman case, declared that that was unconstitutional um, in that only the Congress can uh, suspend habeas corpus, not uh, the president. Uh, but it was all diffused in the politics of the war, as you can imagine. The generals ignored Tawney. Uh, Tawney didn't speak uh, for the full court itself. And after the war, uh, Congress did enact legislation that effectively ratified what Lincoln had done previously. Yeah, go ahead. From the audience, please. Um, having been brought up in the land of Magna Carta and uh, habeas corpus, I take this rather seriously. Um, the diminution of habeas corpus started in Britain during the um, IRA bombings, when I think it was extended, I think from seven days to 21. Yeah. I would like to know what the panel's view is of the present attempts of the British government to extend habeas corpus to its either 28 or 32 days. And Britain, of course, does not have the strong instrument of a written constitution. And I must add to those in the audience who know me, I know I have retired from working for Her Majesty. I can now say what I want. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm glad you did. Joe, why don't you start? Um, so, so the question, I think, if I understand it is, um, before a person who's held uh, in custody in Britain makes an appearance, uh, is, is brought before a magistrate, uh, 28 days can pass, and now they're talking about, and that is an extension of what it used to be, um, and now they're extend, talking about extending it even further to 32. Do I, do I have that? 42? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> right. 42 days. Uh, you know, the folks at Guantanamo have been there for eight years, six years. Um, I'm all in favor of prompt appearance in front of a magistrate so that a process begins. Uh, I think, as a general matter, that process should begin as promptly as possible, as promptly as realistically possible. Uh, Maybe I should get more vexed over whether it's 28 or 42. Uh, clearly, I think 42 is too long. But the administration's point here is that they have no right at all. Uh, they fought that bitterly in both in Rasul and in Boumedin uh, uh, unsuccessfully, and that it finally establishes a right. The fact remains, however, that post 9-11, uh, the administration has yet to present the first syllable, the first word in any proceeding anywhere in the world uh, explaining why any prisoner held as an enemy combatant is in fact, uh, may in fact be lawfully held. They have yet to present the first word of testimony. Uh, yeah, I'm glad you mentioned 9-11 because, you know, it's my view that actually if they had had a live uh, person who was charged with um, uh, staging 9-11, I mean, people would have been happy to execute that person on the street. Um, and we shouldn't forget that. Uh, not everybody, of course. But, you know, that terror that gripped the country um, was very, very strong. And uh, I'm sure people here remember that. I spent a lot of time with the HUAC hearings, too, so I'm glad, glad to see uh, uh, fellow um, don't say uh, fellow traveler. No, no, I won't say fellow traveler. <laughs> but you know, one of the shocking things is the discourse of those hearings. 
um, how open the anti-Semitism is, how absolutely overt the anti quote, foreign is, so that, you know, people will sit in a congressional hearing and say, and just, that, when did you come to this country? And weren't your parents Jews? And, you know, amazing in the halls of Congress, uh, at least amazing for us today. Let's have another question from the audience. Yeah, um, Professor Yeagle talked about a dangerous idea. Um, I'd like to suggest that there is a second dangerous idea uh, relating to habeas corpus in the context of the criminal justice system, and, and that's the idea that finality of proceedings is more important uh, than seeing that the proceedings were fair and that justice were, is done, uh, and I'd ask the panel to comment on that. I'm going to measure my words very carefully. <laughs> oh, I, I quite agree. Um, what tends to happen is that uh, when we have uh, debates, disagreements about substantive values in the country, we tend to resolve them at the level of procedure. We, uh, we, we avoid real confrontation and, and, and we try to, uh, to find some procedural means of uh, uh, finessing things. And that's what tends to happen here uh, there is certainly a, a strong body of opinion that habeas corpus uh, ought to be uh, eliminated altogether uh, in the criminal justice context, and we ought to just be satisfied with uh, convictions and uh, uh, immediate appellate review. But there's certainly a lot of sentiment uh, against that, sentiment in favor of retaining habeas corpus as the kind of extraordinary device that uh, Justice Holmes uh, described. And so what tends to happen is that uh, uh, the opponents of habeas corpus shift ground and uh, uh, propose then not to do away with habeas, but to pile upon habeas lots of procedural restrictions that make it ever so difficult for habeas corpus actually to operate in that simple, uh, 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 elegant way uh, I described uh, the classic model. And so uh, procedural rules that insist upon uh, 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 fixed time periods and, uh, and requirements that uh, litigants uh, do things in particularized ways, else they forfeit any further opportunity to advance claims in court. These sorts of, of uh, procedural arrangements uh, celebrated in service of gaining finality in criminal cases are, I think, uh, uh, a flank attack on the very existence of habeas corpus jurisdiction. I have a question for, um, for Joe. Uh, why is Guantanamo in Guantanamo? And is it true that the remedies of habeas corpus really can't be applied overseas except perhaps in military uh, bases or places controlled by our military? Um, <clears throat> well, the administration uh, made a decision to go to Guantanamo because they believed that they could, on the one hand, create the, the uh, interrogation environment that they wanted to have, uh, be close to analysts and interrogators and so on, it's only 90 miles from Miami, uh, but because of the unique, they believed, because of the unique nature of Guantanamo and our relationship to Cuba and the terms of the lease, that there'd be no jurisdiction in the federal courts. So it was deliberately set up so that they would be able to create any kind of environment they wanted where they could, uh, for as long as they wanted, without uh, judicial involvement. Now, does it need to be in Guantanamo? No, and one of the next uh, round of litigation is, it was obvious what was gonna happen, you know, you put your thumb on a ball of mercury and it squirts out somewhere else. And so when the Supreme Court said there's jurisdiction over Guantanamo, folks at Guantanamo have rights uh, either under the statute or the Constitution to challenge the lawfulness of their detention. It didn't take a rocket scientist to see what was going to happen. They stopped holding people at Guantanamo. The prison at Guantanamo has gotten gradually smaller. It's only 250 people. But the prison at Bagram Air Base has tripled in size, and it's now the new Guantanamo. It's just that Guantanamo sucks all the air out of the room and nobody talks about Bagram. There's no pictures of it on the web. Nobody goes to, you know, they don't have any lawyers. They, they don't have the same set of rights. Um, and no, no media there watches an interrogation take place. Uh, 
So does the writ extend to Bagram? We don't know. We don't know. Another question from the audience. Yes, microphones. Where are the microphones, folks? Yeah, please. Is there a Hello? Question? Yes. Thank you. Where are you? Um, in the two okay, clauses in the Constitution saying what Congress cannot do, they cannot pass an ex post facto law, and they cannot pass a law declaring a person a criminal. Do you find that in passing something like that Patriot Act, which allows, them, allows the executive to do this, declaring someone by not forcing them to have a habeas corpus and say, here, this is why we think this person, we want to take this person into court, saying, uh, this, is the, this is how you've broken the law. Uh, do you find that that violates habeas corpus? In my opinion, passing that Patriot Act saying that they can declare, says that they can declare people criminals by not keeping these fundamental protections. Could you comment on that and see how it might fit in with habeas corpus? Um, it, maybe there's a, and we can chat about this afterwards, but maybe there's a provision of the Patriot Act that you're looking at differently than I am. But in fact, I read the Patriot Act differently. Um, the Patriot Act is, is, is somewhat like the question that was asked here. It requires that if a person is in the country is picked Foreign, uh, foreign national or citizen picked up uh, and held for terrorist, uh, suspicion of terrorist activity, they have to be charged within seven days. Um, so you do initiate a criminal process. Uh, and, and that's relevant to one of the other uh, habeas cases that's going on, a, a fellow named Almari who was picked up here in Peoria and who's held in uh, South Carolina. Um, so I don't view the Patriot Act. In fact, there was a provision in, the, in an earlier draft of the Patriot Act that did suspend the writ. And the um, uh, story on that is that uh, Congressman Sensenbrenner from Wisconsin saw that and just took his red pen out and drew a line through that. Said, well, that's not going to happen. So it's clear that the Patriot Act did not intend to suspend the writ. Larry? Uh -huh. I, I would just add this. It seems to me that, that, that you are on to something here. Uh, you point out uh, that um, generally in, in our political legal culture, uh, we punish only after conviction, after a charge and a determination of guilt. We don't punish, we don't hold people in prison just to incapacitate them lest they commit offenses in the future. And uh, not in all, but in many circumstances in recent years, uh, I'm afraid that, that the uh, purpose of in incapacitation has been legitimized. Um, and I, I would extend that, that point even to uh, most of the prisoners at uh, Guantanamo who understand are not said even by the military to have done anything wrong. They are only said to be enemy combatants that is, people who have served uh, in their own countries in uh, one kind of military service or another, uh, in my view, defending uh, against uh, an American invasion. In any case, they, they are analogous to soldiers. Uh, um, uh, enemy combatants then don't do anything wrong by uh, committing uh, violent acts in service of a legitimate uh, war-making uh, effort. Um, it, it seems then, just to come back to the point, that um, uh, years of, uh, of confinement just to keep people from, quote, returning to the battlefield then runs into the principle in our political culture that uh, we, we don't imprison for punishment uh, unless we are able to convict. And of course, this audience doesn't need reminding, I'm sure, that the people who were innocent of any crimes and were sitting on death row around the country, including an, a sizable number in Illinois, never would have been released without the remedies of habeas corpus and what habeas corpus allowed people to do. I'd also like to just put in a small plug and say, of course, the activities of our uh, Northwestern uh, Clinic and Center on Wrongful Convictions, which is celebrating its 10th year now, is was very important there.
as was the Chicago Tribune, which spent years doing investigative work on those cases, and that work required journalists to be on staff for years. Let's have something else from the audience. <laughs> Uh, my question is uh, more general. I'd like to know if the uh, rights guaranteed to American citizens by the Constitution extend or have extended historically to, um, to non-American citizens living in the United States. Um, it, it depends. That's the short answer. Um, <laughs> for the purposes of this conversation, the principal right that's being, I hope I'm looking in the right place. I couldn't tell where the question is. Yeah, so. it's hard for us to see right. you up is it, there. Is it up there? Okay. Yeah. Uh, the right to liberty as guaranteed by the Fifth Amendment does extend to uh, foreign nationals living in the country, yes. Yeah. You know, one of the interesting things in the development of this law, of course, is the courts get incredibly hung up on, as they should, their courts, and this is what lawyers do and what judges do, um, as like, what is the exact definition of an enemy combatant? So that, you know, people who, who may not have been in an army or done uh, much of anything uh, become declared enemy combatants. But I'd actually like both of our uh, panelists also to address the question of the fact that with the appointment of, quote, conservative federal judges to the majority of seats in the federal judiciary, um, do you think that's going to have a really important effect in the future of habeas corpus? Larry, let's start with you. Oh, that's an empirical question I can't answer. I will tell you this, that uh, I'm a believer in the federal courts, in the independence, the tradition, the integrity of the federal courts. And I believe that uh, those values that we associate with independent Article III federal judges uh, transcend uh, ideology. There are uh, plenty of instances in which uh, right-wing conservative uh, uh, federal judges have done precisely what it seems to me uh, uh, needs to be done in, in the cause of individual liberty. So I wouldn't want to, to and in habeas corpus cases, I, I wouldn't want to, to generalize. I must tell you, I am troubled by the uh, uh, politicization of, of the federal courts, uh, and uh, uh, it seems to me that's, that's something uh, worth a great deal of attention and, and effort. Thank you, Joe. Yeah, I, I mean, if you're asking me, does the, does the representation of the federal bench matter, answer, yes. If you're asking me, uh, are there exceptions and pe folks surprise you, answer yes. Um, I tend to think that the uh, focus on just the constitution of the bench, uh, as though that exists separate from uh, sort of a prevailing social conversation, is uh, misguided. And that in fact, there are times when a dominant conversation uh, what I call you know, the, the social narrative, uh, moves the court and the court helps move the narrative in certain ways. So you know, one of the classic examples of that is for many years the court and members of the court railed against uh, the Miranda decision. Right. And, and, and right. the Chief Justice, Chief Justice Rehnquist was one of the railers. And when a case came up that gave them an opportunity to overturn it, mm -hmm. he was the author of the decision that upheld it. Uh, and, right. so and, you never know. And, and, and it's, it's not just that you never know, right. it's that Miranda had become so deeply embedded mm -hmm. in the social conversation mm -hmm. that it was just impossible for the court. So you don't want to view the bench as isolated from, no, right. Right? they are participants in this thing we call yeah. a social conversation. Yeah, and the polity. Another question from the floor, please. If you lawyers had been advising President Bush right after 9-11, how would you have advised him to proceed in dealing with suspected terrorists? All right. <laughs> well, that's a challenging question. <laughs> yeah, at Fenway Park, we call that a slow pitch. <laughs> I have no idea. But I will tell you, I, I would not have commissioned uh, federal uh, executive officers in various agencies to begin a nationwide uh, uh, program uh, 
of uh, detaining thousands upon thousands of people uh, and holding them uh, a great deal of time incommunicado, uh, ostensibly uh, in connection with 9-11. There is a very uh, important, interesting report done by one of the inspectors general uh, about the use of immigration laws uh, yeah. right after 9-11. It was unlawful, it was a duplicitous, uh, dishonest uh, use of statutes and, or, and uh, regulations meant to, to, to handle immigration matters. It was a ruse in order then to, in some wise, try to justify uh, this campaign of uh, 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 detaining uh, people just for questioning and for an extraordinary period of time. I would not have permitted that. Yeah. Joe? Um, That's our five-minute warning, by the way. Okay. Let me confine my comments to what I know best, which is the um, detention of the alleged enemy combatants in that world. I, I hope that what I would have done, and I frame it that way because I do not have any illusions that I am have you know, sort of a greater moral rectitude or a greater sort of clarity of vision than the next guy. Um, uh, but what I hope I would have done is what Colin Powell and uh, Will Taft did uh, at the State Department, which is to counsel them strongly against jettisoning the Geneva Conventions, notwithstanding ambiguity about whether, whether and to what extent the Geneva Conventions apply. They said you need to look beyond this legal ambiguity and not make a legal judgment for this perceived policy preference because it will backfire. And I hope that I would have recommended vigorously, uh, as Jack Goldsmith later did, against the use of aggressive, uh, coercive interrogation techniques. Not just Jack Goldsmith, but every uh, 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 service branch in the United States military. Um, because it's, it starts you down a path that they had been down before and knew they had gotten beaten up on that dark street corner right there and knew it was a mistake. Uh, I hope that I would have made similar recommendations. Um, you know, the amazing thing is, is that one of the consolations of reading history is you have the feeling uh, everything has happened before. But if you read about detentions in the 1880s and 1910 that happened in this country, and you read the rhetoric as uh, Joe did in earlier, you know, you see that when a fever sweeps the country, um, you know, things are going to happen that wouldn't happen when times are peaceful, and it is an enormous challenge always. One last question from, yes, please. Yes, um, we've learned today that the king uh, habeas corpus came about because of a bad king. <laughs> we have uh, Guantanamo that we've all been worried about and felt, how could this happen? We have a rule of law in this country. We have a new president coming in, whoever he may be. Um, there's now been this pattern that was set by Bush of I am president, I am king, I can do whatever I want, I can set aside rule of law. What do we as a society, when we see this happen, do? How can we prevent it? And you say, oh, we can elect the right person. Well, again. Um, a uh, right person can go astray as well. But what do we as a society do? I'll ask both our panelists to speak to that very briefly, Larry, because I see our time is up. Well, I will just say very briefly that uh, if uh, a rascal in power is, is acting uh, uh, unlawfully, then we can turn the rascal out. Uh, uh, President Bush, of course, is not standing for election on Tuesday. Joe? Um, you know, I'm asked all the time whether I support things like, uh, supported in the past, things like impeachment and, and, and indictments for, for people like Rumsfeld and so on. And I, the answer is no. I do not support it. I think it's a bad idea I, for a lot of reasons that I'm happy to go into yeah. later. I think it's a mistake. Hmm. Uh, but um, I have come to believe that the most important thing we can do is reclaim a conversation that dies during these difficult times, that that conversation is the wellspring of democratic change. 
you can't get the democratic change at the and any other place but the ballot box in this country. Uh, you can't get it in the courts, not really. That's the lesson. Notwithstanding the cases that we have prevailed in, you can't really get it in the courts. And, and there are a lot of people who say you shouldn't be able to. Um, and you can o only get it if a room like this fills up. So that's what you should do. Yeah. Thank you very much.